Hello, and welcome to History is Gay, a podcast that examines the underappreciated and overlooked queer ladies, gents, and gentle envies that have always been there in the unexplored corners of history, because history has never been as straight as you think. Welcome to 2022. I can't believe that we're already here. Time is not real. Uh, welcome to year two of the pandemic, year three. I'm not sure. Everything's crazy. I'm Lee. Hi. And I am joined again by my lovely guests from our last episode on Amazons of Greek myth and Scythian warrior women. I've got Essie Lucier and Megan Rose here in our virtual podcast studio once again. Hi, y'all. Hello. Hello. Oh, oh. No. coming in weird, Meg. Coming in weird. <laughs> coming in hot and weird. <laughs> hot and weird. Super excited to hot. be going into uh, junior year of pandemic. I'm very excited. Oh, God, mm, I can't wait for senioritis, though. Mm. <laughs> As a I, junior, you know what? No, yeah. no. I'm. I would like to veto anything with that ends with itis <laughs> post 2020. Thanks. <laughs> You're right. I take it back. I take it all back. <laughs> yeah, uh, I really enjoy the. Um, I, I do think Meg. If at some point you write a memoir, it's gonna have to be called "Coming in Hot and Weird." Well. Uh, so Thank you so that. much. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Honestly, what a compliment in Meg's wow. world. You just wow, gave <laughs> wow. Uh, well, for anybody that did not tune in to our last episode, and um, if that's you listening in, you should pause this episode and listen to the episode before this on Amazon Stoner Horse Girls. Yeah. Speaking From, of hot and weird. Uh, Scythia. Yeah, speaking of hot and weird and horse people who are not, in fact, centaurs. There might, you know, there might be some some recurring inside jokes in that last episode that you might miss out on. But uh, for those who are not going to listen to my instructions and not go back and listen to that episode, can y'all both just briefly tell the listeners who you are and what you do? I'm a music person. I'm a words that person. That was Meg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name's Meg, and I write music for stuff, and I try to make it enjoyable for people. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, and I am Luce, and I am a words person that works with Meg to write things that put music and words together that people enjoy. Yeah, last time we we talked a little bit about y'all's work putting together Xena Warrior Musical, as well as uh, your newest project on Atalanta. So go back and listen to that episode near the end there. We have a really wonderful premiere of a demo. But yeah, today for this episode, we're going to be continuing our theme, talking about the history of gender transgressing women warriors again, and where last time we looked at the Amazons of Greek myth and the nomadic Scythian warriors warrior women that they were based on. This episode, we are examining some other women warriors who queered expectations and norms outside of their sex assigned at birth all the way around the world. Folks who found their way into traditionally masculine spheres of society, many of whom various historians have likened or even named after the Amazons. So we're going to be taking you on a little whirlwind tour all around the world. And by all around the world, I mean like three countries. Uh, in terms of content warnings, we will be discussing some folks in a country in Africa, and this is happening in the 1800s, so there will be brief discussions of the transatlantic slave trade. We will put the time code in the notes, as always. In terms of format for this episode, it's going to be kind of a mix between people and concept focused. We're going to be focusing on each group of people separately, and we'll have a couple of individual folks as examples. And then we will, as always, end the podcast with how gay were they? Our personal ranking about how likely it is that they weren't straight. Before we start, I've got some pretty fun announcements that I wanted to uh, put up at the top here. First of all, I've been telling everybody about our exciting forthcoming Patreon revamp. And surprise, it is no longer forthcoming. It is here. It has happened. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I've worked hard on it. 
<laughs> Sound effects. Uh, I'm I'm really excited to reveal kind of the the revamped tiers. So if you go to the support section on our website, or if you go to patreoncom gay, you will see some new tiers. We're starting at the three dollar level and going up to the fifty dollar level per month. We also have annual memberships available now, which you can get at a discount. And the perks that are going to be included, we're keeping the Sappho Salon minisodes, and there's going to be about six per year. We're also going to be doing live watches of things like pop culture tie-in movies and TV shows, or even just, hey, everybody want to watch a cool queer movie. There will be opportunities to get tickets to queer history trivia nights. And we actually have started up a brand new History is Gay Discord server, which I want to do a big shout out to our listeners, Ender and Alex. They are our first mods in that space, and they've been working on that space with me for the last couple of months to get it all ready for everyone. Y'all have been asking for some sort of community where everybody can come together and chat and show fun pictures of things like their guinea pigs and their cats and share your own creative endeavors. So I'm really excited about that space, and I hope that you will join. That's available to all of our patrons at any level. And if you really want to splurge and you want to go up to the top level, the $50 a month, there is an exclusive t-shirt design by Maddie Palmieri, who is a really good friend of mine. And it is inspired by our Sappho shitpost generator. It has Sappho on it with the words OG lesbian. And that is the only way you can get that t-shirt for now. And I'm really excited about it and really proud. So I hope that folks will go and check out the new Patreon space. And uh, if you're able to, you know, give $3 a month, you'll be able to get in on on all this fun new stuff that is coming in this brand new year of History is Gay. Uh, And then the last thing is I also wanted to kind of put out a little poll here in the podcast space. I did it on Twitter. But I've been thinking about whether or not we should get a P.O. box, and I wanted to ask folks if anybody would be interested in utilizing that, if people would send things, or if it seems like it's a waste of time and money. So uh, if you are interested in any of that, send something to the email, ping us on Twitter, let us know what you think about that. But yeah, so Luce and Meg, what are you most excited about getting into all the cool stuff we're going to be talking about today. Um, I am super excited to talk about virginity construct is what I'm looking at currently in front of me on this uh, outline. And Neat. I am super into the Onabugeisha female samurais. Yes. Yeah. Damn. I- <laughs> I know. I think they might be my favorite as well. I mean, and you have to um, say, like, the shield maidens, You obviously, that's... Viking shield yeah, maidens. Yeah, how can you not be really excited about that? Yes. Uh, so before we get into the women we're going to talk about in this episode, uh, just had a couple of little follow-ups from our Amazons episode. Some things we wanted to circle back around to. A couple of p- folks wrote in after we put the episode out with some really wonderful little add-ons. So, Which is uh, awesome! Have, yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> and there's not you know many opportunities I get to kind of do follow-ups because we have totally different topics. So uh, first up, our listener John Tully sent an email telling us that you can actually enjoy some really cool Atalanta references in the video game Immortals Phoenix Rising. Uh, You can fight her as a boss. There are also weapons and dungeons named after her. You can even do your own version of the Caledonian Boar Hunt. Uh, This definitely sounds like a game to check out, and I will be doing so specifically to be able to get my Greek myth nerd on to fill the Assassin's Creed Odyssey-sized hole in my heart, because I really miss playing a game that allows me to run around ancient Greece like I'm Xena. Yes. you know, real quick, Luz has almost beaten this game. I'm so I'm not trying to speak for oh. you here. I just <laughs> yeah, know okay, this so, okay, fact right about can, you. So yeah, you can you can tell us a little bit about your experience with this immortal. Yes, I love Phoenix Rising. I love this game so so much. Um, it's beautiful. It's an open world concept which I love. What I really appreciate about Atalanta when she appears in the game is that she always appears with a bear. So it's like mm. her individual as a boss that you have to beat, but every single time she manifests, she also has a bear that you have to beat in right. tandem. It's like her, her like wraith that comes up, Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. And they're always together. So even in the vault of Atalanta, it's the same thing. You're dealing with bears. It's, it, it was right on for me. So I love that reference. Nice. Uh, as the last bit of follow-up from the last episode, we have another listener, Cheryl Morgan, who reached out to us with some more information about the NRA, the androgynous Scythian priestesses, 
and some things that she was able to tell us about the assumption that they drank pregnant mare's urine as an ancient form of HRT. There seems to be a little bit more complexity to this than we were able to find in our initial research, mostly based on some mistranslations and kind of misinterpretations of Ovid's writing. So I'm actually just going to read through Cheryl's email because it was really wonderful and comprehensive. So Cheryl writes, The starting point, as you noted, is Timothy Taylor's History of Sex, which he wrote in the 1990s when he used to present TV documentaries before going off to the University of Vienna to be a professor of prehistory. Taylor bases his ideas on Ovid's Medica Mina Faciae Feminae, which means women's facial cosmetics, in which Ovid says, very roughly translated, don't put any trust in that disgusting stuff they get from breeding mares. In the Amores, he mentions a witch who knows how to make this stuff. But that's it. No mention of urine. Taylor assumed that this was Scythian witch lore that Ovid would have picked up when he was exiled to the coast of the Black Sea. But Taylor's an archaeologist, not a classicist, so he didn't ask the obvious questions about the text. Firstly, these things were written before Ovid was exiled, so whatever knowledge he was parroting was knowledge that was probably common in Rome. The next obvious question is whether anyone else in Rome had written about this, and did they say what that disgusting stuff actually was? So I, Cheryl, consulted an expert, Dr. Liz Gloin of Royal Holloway, who is also big into classical reception, and, Lucy will appreciate this, a huge fan of the Rock's Hercules film. I love that film. Uh, <laughs> she did some digging for me. And it turns out that many classical writers, from Aristotle to Pliny, wrote about a supposed, Afro a supposed aphrodisiac made from a substance called hypomenes, which is found on the heads of newly born foals, which is basically a little sack of embryo poo. So Ovid was right. It is disgusting. I've talked to people who know about horse biology, and they tell me there's no reason to think it would have high estrogen content. Of course, this doesn't mean that the NRA did not drink mare's urine, but that doesn't seem to be what Ovid was talking about. Unfortunately, the story found its way into a PhD thesis by Helen Savage. The thesis was about trans people and Christian theology, which is the sort of thing us trans folks would pick up. I also agree with that. Uh, and it's now an established part of internet trans lore that Ovid said that NRAs drink mare's urine. As far as the NRAs go themselves, while I don't know if they had hormone treatment, I'm pretty sure that they would have had surgery. Because if your culture depends on horses, one of the most important things you learn to do is castrate the excess male foals. Stallions are very competitive, and you don't want them killing each other. So the Scythians would have been very knowledgeable about castration and its effects. So I just wanted to read that out. It's got a lot of really wonderful information. Thank you so much for sharing this, Cheryl. And it's really important to definitely interrogate the sources. And like you said, it doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't have access to this as some sort of hormone treatment, but that's not exactly what the sources and what Ovid were saying. Sometimes you play like a telephone game of historians. So with that, with our, you know, 20 minute long or so intro, let's get into the meat. Uh, we're going to be taking you through three groups of people, three countries. We are going to start on the African continent in a kingdom that is no longer around, but is now the country of Benin. So we're going to start there. And then we're going to be talking about female samurai in Japan and then some Viking shield maidens and Valkyries. Uh, so starting with our Amazon-like women in Africa, wanted to give a little bit of background. Throughout pre-colonial Africa, there have been many different queer traditions among multiple genders, one of which we wanted to highlight as our word of the week, the concept of female husbands. So we've talked on the podcast before about historical constructions of gender being defined not necessarily as like an innate quality or an internal sense of self like we think of gender nowadays, but more sometimes to do with specific roles being played in society. What actual things you're doing in society, what dress you wear, what functions are you fulfilling in society. And this role of female husbands, which is a, a cross-cultural tradition practiced by over 30 different peoples and communities across southern, eastern, and western Africa, including the Igbo of Nigeria, Zulu in southern Africa, and the Nandi tribe in Kenya, is one of these constructions. Yeah, and women-women marriage is relatively common in this way, but it's 
a bit more complex than just female homosexuality. There is a transitioning of strict gender roles that happens here. So a woman usually wealthy and higher in social standing, which is typically the case, right, whenever this these mm. kinds of transgressions are allowed to happen, could marry wives for themselves without the need for a man in the arrangement. She would pay the dowry and gain husband's rights over her wife as in a traditional man-woman marriage. And in doing so, she actually becomes and is viewed as a man in terms of the societal status, elevating her standing. But in many of these traditions, she would still dress and personally identify as a woman. Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes these relationships involved a sexual or romantic element with their partner. But many historians argue the more practical reasons for female husbandry, which (laughs) who knows that might still be happening today. They could be non-sexual and even a little futile in indigenous African cultural outlet for women to cement themselves, not just within a sexual relationship, but within multiple overlapping layers of hierarchy. So when it comes to (laughs) feudal, I think we all have associations with any type of romantic relationship becoming feudal. And I think that it's really cool, (laughs) like just um, putting it out in the open that this would be a social hierarchy type of feudal. Of a right, partnership. Yeah. It's very interesting to me on purpose. Kind of being able to to surpass. I mean, you know, it sucks that there's like hierarchical relationships in a relationship. But the idea of, you know, someone being able to kind of transition class and, and role in society based on their kind of placement in that relationship right. is really interesting. Right. And it's calling it like it is. <laughs> let's let's be real here. Relationship um, escalators, they've been around for a very long time. <laughs> they have. I guess there you go. I suppose they called them staircases back in the day. <laughs> All right. So these relationships also allowed women to have a greater degree of sexual freedom, which we love, and allowed them to have multiple male partners, mostly men whose duty was to provide the means for them to have children. Mm -hmm. And any child they had were taken care of by their female husband and carried her name. And this was legitimate in the eyes of society, which is very interesting to me that this comes up because carried her name... This was legitimate mm. in the eyes of society. I have not seen this very often, taking a the woman's name. Well, I th- you know. I think it's I think it was so cool to to see this and and one of the reasons why I wanted to put it in here is that it it kind of goes back to those myths of Amazons that we were talking about, only seeking out men for procreation and here we have uh, you know, a, a similar kind of precedent for that happening in real life that that wasn't necessarily just the makeup of, of you know, a bunch of Greek male writers writing it as like a, you know, a horror story of like, oh, God, this is what happens when women have agency. This yeah. is like just happening. And, and-, and also like <laughs> knowing, OK, I'm a bisexual person, knowing men in a certain way, this is not a problem for them. <laughs> <laughs> this setup is fine. It's ideal even for a, right. a lot of men. I'm not saying all men. I did that not on purpose. Men. I did hashtag, that on purpose. Hashtag not all men. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, you know, the, the multiple male partners thing, a man shows up and is like, yes, I will have sex with you and not take care of the baby. That's for your female husband to do. Like, wow. I'm just saying, wow. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I'm speechless. Well, so, Sorry. <laughs> as is as is the uh, as is usually how you are with Meg. Yep. Sometimes. Sometimes. Keeping it weird. Uh, <laughs> hot and weird. Hot, keep it uh, hot and weird. Coming in hot and weird. Coming in. Uh, there's there's obviously so much more to talk about regarding female husbands and the ways that they differ and intersect among different ethnic, tribal, and community groups. There's also been appropriation of the term for non-African societies and groups that transgress gender in similar ways. It definitely deserves its own episode or episodes that we'll 100% be covering in the future. But I thought it was important to provide some of this context kind of as a bedrock for the folks we're going to talk about next, especially to highlight the tradition of like fluid gender and gender roles throughout pre-colonial and colonial Africa. So the first folks we are going to talk about are folks that are referred to by historians as the Dahomey Amazons. These are the folks that we mentioned historians have actually named after these glorious, ruthless warrior women that are seen in Greek myth. And uh, we figured we'd start by giving you a little bit of background about what the kingdom of Dahomey is. So uh, Luce is going to take us in a little bit with that. 
Yes. The Kingdom of Dahomey in West Africa, located in what is now present-day Benin, which is bordering Nigeria, existed between 1600 to 1904, when the kingdom became a French protectorate. Protectorate. (laughs) Protectorate. After two Franco-Dahomian wars and colonialist forces had fully encroached on the kingdom and was made up primarily of the Fon ethnic group. So queerness in pre-colonialism existed much the same in Dahomey as other African countries. And because sexes were segregated in early childhood and adolescence, homosexuality was practiced and accepted as commonplace as part of that phase in life, but expected that more heterosexual partnerships would be prioritized in adulthood, which is really similar Mm -hmm. to what we were talking about as far as Atalanta and kind of the wild feminine of childhood being outgrown. Yeah, it's what what we also see in like Imperial China and in Greece is that it's something that's very accepted and very expected as you are younger. And then when your role in society is kind of changing and you're expected to be married um, and fulfill these uh, kind of patrilineal procreation roles and that's kind of where where we're coming from here. So Dahomey was once referred to as Black Sparta. The person who coined that was a 19th century missionary named Francesco Borghero. Of course it was a name given to them. They did not call themselves yeah, we're, we're Black gonna Sparta. Talk, <laughs> we're going to talk a lot about uh, the sources that we have here and the ways that Dahomey has been talked about and kind of the way that um, Dahomeans have talked about themselves. Right. So Dahomey was a very militaristic, expansion-minded country, often at war with neighboring territories. The kingdom became a major regional power in the 1720s, which is later than I would have thought, actually, when I was looking at this, um, Mm. when it conquered the coastal kingdoms of Alada and Ouida. And with control over these key coastal cities, Dahomey became a major center in the Atlantic slave trade. Until 1852, when the British imposed a naval blockade to stop the trade. So the women warriors of Dahomey, this is an all-female military regiment of warriors. And the term Amazons, uh, as you might have expected, doesn't come from these folks themselves. It comes from colonizing observers, noting, quote, their similarity to the mythical Amazons of ancient Anatolia and the Black Sea and was probably first applied during like the 1840s. And it's currently actually used among French speaking Dahomeyan natives. Um, so that is the French is, is the one of the main languages spoken in Benin today. Indigenous Dahomeans uh, referred to these women as Mino or Minon in indigenous Fon language, which meant our mothers, or uh, sometimes you'll see them referred to as Ahosi or uh, king's wives, which was uh, more generally applied to kind of all women and eunuchs who were associated with the palace. Nowadays, if you are in Benin, most of the time you will hear these women warriors referred to as Agogie by current Benin residents. And just a, you know, big kind of red flag note on these sources is much of the info we have about these people comes from European accounts in the 18th and 19th centuries. So take all of that with a grain of salt. However, we will be pulling from an article by historian Robin Law, who kind of attempts to reconcile and balance these really Eurocentric accounts with indigenous tradition and history from Dahomey uh, and Dahomeyan natives themselves and kind of first hand accounts that were actually written down from some of the last surviving Amazons. This regiment was most likely the result of fewer men in the kingdom due to both casualties of war with neighboring territories and also the effects of the transatlantic slave trade. The origin is kind of messy, but the most consistent that we found was from uh, King Gezo, who ruled from 1818 to 1858, who claimed to create the Amazon force, but other accounts recorded female forces as early as the 1700s, either as like bodyguards for Queen Hongbei, who was the older sister of King Agaja, or as like elephant hunters, a band of elephant hunters who kind of formed into this military force. It's likely that the Mino were originally ceremonial or ritual in nature, and Gezo is the person who kind of transitioned them to a more serious military as Dahomeyan territory was being threatened by uh, neighboring Yoruba nations. It may have also kind of started from the convention of banning men from the palace. There's a quote from one of the sources that has King Agaja in 1726 saying, quote, no man sleeps within the walls of any of my palaces after the sunset but myself. So that's one place they could have uh, started from. 
Early on, the women were recruited from foreign captives, so people who were, you know, captured from from neighboring territories as prisoners of war, but later were recruited from free Dahomeyan women and daughters of local chieftains, sometimes as young as eight or nine years old. So kind of brutal from the start. Now, and that's so interesting that (laughs) this king says, no man sleeps within the walls of any of my palaces after the sunset by myself. Mm -hmm. I only want to be surrounded by women. Like, well, because, you know, it's a threat. Yeah, absolutely. But I I don't know. Well, it seems counter. I think what you're saying is it seems a little counterintuitive to then uh, have a band of highly trained Basically, female really assassins, deadly <laughs> really deadly right. people around you. <laughs> right. <laughs> in terms of numbers, accounts record that there were between 600 and 800 female soldiers in the 1760s to the 1840s, and estimated to have expanded to between 6,000 and 8,000 women by 1851, about a third of the entire army. Numbers expanding and diminishing dependent on what sort of conflicts Dahomey was in at the time. So, you know, they were a kingdom interested in expanding, so... The Mino ultimately suffered major losses in the franco dahomeyan Wars in the 1890s, and their numbers were reduced to around 50 by French colonials. Woof. Yeah. That is yeah, so rough. That's, that's a lot. That is a huge decimation. Yeah. And, and I wonder, is there any sort of correlation between the French colonizing the Dahomeans and all of the crap that was happening in America? Was there any sort of correlation? I not certain. Okay. I mean, you know, really the the 1800s, mid 1800s is kind of where um, expansionism and imperialism, imperialism was like really, Jinx. really at its height. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we have a, we have a, yeah. a, uh, a jingle here on this podcast called Fuck Colonialism. And it comes up in nearly every single episode because fuck colonialism, fuck imperialism. Fuck, 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 fuck colonialism. So this is where, I mean, this is where you see Britain, like, expanding the fuck everywhere by just invading forces kind of all over the world. And everybody else in the European continent was kind of following suit. And so I don't know that there's necessarily a one-to-one correlation, but it certainly was the thing to do at the time. Totally. And fuck Especially <laughs> if you are, you know, a European going to Africa to get minerals, to get gold, to get spices, to get fucking people. Uh, this yeah. is, you know, this was yeah. very common. You're I going mean, you there driven by greed. Fra- fuck France is going there. Portugal is going there. There's a huge percentage of Portuguese uh, involvement in the slave trade as well. All right, so accounts by members of the French Foreign Legion wrote of how impressed the French soldiers were at the boldness of the Amazons, recounting that they fought, quote, with extreme valor, always ahead of the other troops, well trained for combat and very disciplined, unquote, which just kind of makes me a little bit sick because I'm like, fuck you. (laughs) They could definitely beat your asses. And you're just like, oh, yes, they fought. They fought well. <laughs> We're That's the adversary. Cute. That's cute. Like, pat, pat. It's like, well, you know, if your numbers were different, you would have been dead. Dick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it kind of well, it kind of reminds me of um, the way that we talked about uh, the way that uh, Amazons are written about in their encounters with Greek heroes. Yes. Even though the Amazons were defeated, they're still written of as like a really formidable enemy. And so, while it feels you know certainly super yucky to be like these French soldiers who just decimated a population of anywhere from six hundred to six thousand people to numbers in the double digits. They're still saying like, hey, these women were like really formidable enemies. They, you know, fought really well. They were really well trained for combat. They were fucking scary, honestly. Um, And they have a really, really strong reputation as being very fearsome, which we'll kind of unpack a little bit, too. Yeah, it definitely becomes an accomplishment, an aggrandizing accomplishment to speak of. So ultimately, the Mino were disbanded when Dahomey became a French protectorate. The women were supposedly the last to surrender. And according to rumor, among the occupying French army, some surviving Amazons secretly remained in the capital and assassinated French officers. Also, Ooh. like a major motion picture, <laughs> please. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And here is a quote from Smithsonian. Each allowed herself to be seduced by a French officer, waited for him to fall asleep, and then cut his throat with his own bayonet. 
amazing. That, isn't that some sort of painting somewhere? Like, it should be. <laughs> oh, yes. Are you talking about, uh, I think Meg's making fun of me because I always talk about uh, Judith slaying Holofernes. Yeah, I pretty absolutely much. am. You are, you are. Making, I knew exactly. Knew it. I knew exactly I knew what it. you're talking about. My friend has that as a pillow. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I want obvi- Artemisia's so version, good. obviously, right? Is that which one? Yeah. Then, yeah. yeah. Ugh, I'll, uh, so I'll, I'll link you to it offline. Absolutely. My next birthday gift, Mag. Take notes. There you go. <laughs> um, so travelers in the 1930s and 40s recorded encounters with ex-Amazons, some of whom had taken to making their living by spinning. So this is an interesting connection, right? Uh, because spinning is such a female craft and art, especially when we talked about the Greeks. I don't know. I just found Mm -hmm. that that really interesting. So they usually struggled to adjust to civilian life. They found difficulty finding new roles in their communities and tended to start fights, which obviously... What else? Yeah, I mean, if you're <laughs> you you know, trained to be a ruthless warrior and then suddenly you're dumped into civilian society, I mean, we see that every day with veterans. So yeah, you know. absolutely. I can see the film now. It's kind of like you know the club that they all hang out in, and it's the end of the right. 19th century. <laughs> it's like one of those you know old Victorian explorer films. Yeah, they come together for one final. You got the crackling and the yeah, yeah. It's gonna be good. Yeah, as as late as 1978, uh, a a been Beninese historian actually interviewed a woman named Nawi in the village of Kinta, who actually claimed to have fought the French in 1892 and may have been the last surviving Dahomey Amazon. And she didn't die until November 1979 aged, the quote that I found was well over a 100 years old. Hmm. Serving in the Mino offered women an opportunity to raise to positions of command and influence, gaining wealth along the way. We love that. One 1860s account by Richard Burton mentioned that the troops under Gezo lived in his compound and were supplied with tobacco, alcohol, and as many as 50 slaves per warrior. Complicated. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely a complicated legacy. Mm -hmm. However, powerful. Okay, you did this to gain power and freedom. Historian Stanley Alpern, the author of the only English language full length study on the Amazon, notes that, quote, when Amazons walked out of the palace, they were preceded by a slave girl carrying a bell. The sound told every male to get out of their path, retire a certain distance, and look the other way, unquote. Don't fuck with me, which is basically the face that I put on whenever I feel scared in New York City. <laughs> And it works. There you go. It fucking works, by the way. <laughs> Mino also held prominent roles in the Grand Council, even taking part in creating and debating kingdom policy, involved mm-hmm. in politics. Yeah, so they were really, really well respected from kind of a political standpoint as well. They were respected and, and feared. That is the key. Yeah. Really seen as like ruthless and dedicated, especially considering their extensive training. And their training, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of things straight from Dahomeans themselves. A lot of these come from kind of otherizing and sexualizing colonialist sources. Because they were too Um, busy, like, being politicians and being right. fearsome. Yeah, but but the, these these things that these people see in these accounts really emphasize like discipline and an indifference to pain, which is really complex. Different accounts from these observers noted that they like wrestled one another. They did survival training that involved being sent into the forest with minimal rations for days at a time. And there's um, accounts where they the, the observers were like welcomed into the village and then were shown kind of a demonstration of here. Here's what happens when we, here's a demonstration of what happens when we capture a neighboring enemy. And so one of the the accounts, the, the lion's account, uh, has a quote here. Part of their training was to crawl through piles of razor sharp, thorny acacia branches, the bravest presented with belts made of the tree as tangible proof that pain did not affect them. Damn. Yeah. I, I, str- I struggled with putting this in here um, because I think it's it's really interesting to think of like, okay, this is some really, really intense military training. But I also think it's really important to, you know, not let that just hang there um, because, you know, these are observations that are coming from European sources. And to me, uh, as somebody living in the, you know, 21st century, it, it has an eerily kind of similar echo to the super gross, like, racial biases present in the medical community mm-hmm. in terms of pain assessment. Like, there Absolutely. are, you know, there are, there are some really fucked up practices right now in the medical community that, you know, suggest that 
black people have different pain thresholds or don't feel pain the same way as white people. So I'm like, I'm hesitant to give it much merit is like, you know, initially you're like, whoa, that's so cool. Yeah. They're like, you know, but I, I want to like really put a big old grain of salt on that of like, right. okay, without context, this sounds really cool. And yet also, like, we have to think about who is making these observations and are these being kind of exaggerated for the, you know, exoticizing element? Ex- absolutely. Not feeling pain is much different than building distress tolerance. Yeah. Uh, there were even accounts like describing the practice of carrying out executions and initiating young and new recruits with orders to behead their enemies and prisoners. European observers frequently wrote of the Amazon superiority to the male soldiers in Dahomey. This is a Wilmot reference from 1863. Quote, they are far superior to the men in everything, in appearance, dress, in figure, in activity, in their performances as soldiers, and in bravery. End quote. I love how (laughs) their performances as soldiers and bravery. Of course, this guy is going to notice how they look first. Right. Yeah. Fine. Whatever. <laughs> but at least he said, and in their performance as soldiers and in bravery. Like, fantastic. The Amazons may have been structured much in the same way as the army as a whole, with a center contingent made up of the king's bodyguards, flanked by right and left wings under separate commanders. The Amazons didn't fight as a separate unit, but as part of the corresponding male group to form a single division, each male officer or unit having an Amazon counterpart. Yeah, so they were like fully integrated into the into the army, you know, and weren't like, you go off and do this separate thing. Right. But they were like really frontline. Lee, do you think that it was also a tactic to take other armies off guard? That there were women? I think there's definitely there there's definitely an element of that in there, I think. It's it's hard to say because there are also, you know, other kind of similar practices, but these are, you know, these are the folks that like have one of the only, you know, groups of folks that have like this full like regiment of these trained women. So I don't know. I don't know how much I can speculate on that there. I think we're going into queerness in gender transgression now. So heck yeah, this is exciting. Uh, so Amazons were thought of in terms of several different conventional female roles. The Dahomean idiom of Mino, meaning our mothers, as well as Ahosi, meaning king's wives, and even perhaps his daughters, based on sayings reported by one of the European visitors. So this is a Forbes account from 1851, saying, Gezo has born us again. We are his wives, his daughters, his soldiers, his sandals. Any comments on, on, what, on what that means? <laughs> on the sandals. On the sandals. <laughs> I mean, I think it's just, you know, that that they're kind of acting as as extensions of the king. But where things are really interesting is that much in the way female husbands adopted a male gender based on their roles, so did the Mino. They were considered to become men upon their conscription to the service. So that's basically a really old account of genders made up. Like we <laughs> Right, exactly. It's basically like giving in to that. Yep, we can change it whenever we want. So another Forbes account from 1851, quote, we were women, we are now men, Gezo has borne us again. Uh, Forbes account also mentions a translation of a war chant, quote, as the blacksmith takes an iron bar and by fire changes its fashion, so have we changed our nature. We are no longer women, we are men. Whoa. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that quote. It's, you know, and these are things that, you know, these are these are war chants. These are things that, you know, they're going around and they're they're shouting and, you know, reiterating all the time is this idea that I mean, it's it's interesting because, you know, it kind of deconstructs a lot of things about violence being so inherently linked to like masculinity and that, you know, in order to be a part of this very kind of violent nature, you kind of transgress your femininity and move into this masculine space. But I, I, I I thought that was really interesting. It's incredibly interesting. It also brings up like seeing, reading this through the lens of today. Okay, we still don't need the binary here. Uh, But here's some more evidence of that. So in 1920, recorded testimony from Tata Achache, a former Mino, confirmed this as an indigenous Dahomean idiom, recalling that she was told, quote, you are a man, unquote, after she had killed and disemboweled her first enemy. So like what we were just that's, talking about, like, that's so crazy. you're a man now. It's like new, tra- new trans life hack. Want to transition? 
just just kill a man. Just kill a man. You're just kill a man, and then and, you're man. You know, yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's not New about transition. body parts. It never has been. It's about murder. <laughs> New transition life hack. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's so true though. That's so that is so real. Is like when we're talking about this, it really is about your performance in your societal role, and it's about your actions, the way that you perform gender within them, right? Um, which I think is really cool. Uh, let's uh, let's dive into a little bit of sexuality about them uh, before we move in move on to our next group of folks. Sure. So sexuality, you know, are described as celibate or virgins. So typical, I guess, of you know, if we were talking about ancient Greek society, this is very much Amazons have this dichotomy as well. And Mm -hmm. um, Artemis, like the goddess of the Amazons, is also supposed to be celibate or described that way. So Forbes' account from 1851 describes that they live in chastity, are not supposed to marry, and scorn the softer allurements of their nature. I love that word, allurements. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They were all considered legally married to the king. Not surprising, considering many Amazons were recruited from Ahosi or the king's wives, as we previously discussed. Uh, it was unlikely that the king ever had sexual relations with the Mino, however, and if they happened to be so favored by the king, they usually would have been removed from active military service. Mm-hmm. Suppose that has something to do with uh, pregnancy, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, pregnancy, and also um, I, I think it's it has to do with you know that kind of gender transgressing as well, because the Mino were were also prohibited from having sex with anyone else. Right. Um, it's so if you are you know if you are not being chosen as one of the king's wives and you're part of this regiment, you must be celibate. And adultery was punishable by death it, for the men who engaged with them as well. So this marriage, quote unquote, to the king effectively rendered these women celibate. So, you know, not necessarily out of any specific wants or desires, but this is, you know, this is your duty to the king. And the account from the 1864 anthropologist who was there, Richard Burton, suggests that they practiced lesbianism, writing, As a rule, these si- fighting celibatares prefer the morosa voluptus, or morose pleasure, of the schoolmen and the peculiarities of the tenth muse, making reference to Sappho. Mm-hmm. Oblique, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so he's it's 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 very titillating and other otherizing, right? So Robin Law, the historian who's kind of you know trying to unpack a lot of these outsider accounts, writes whether this reflected anything more than a projection of Burton's own obsession with aberrant sexual practices must, however, remain uncertain. His belief may have been an inference from the fact that, which he notes elsewhere, there were in Dahomey not only sex workers officially licensed, to, and he does not use the word sex workers, but we're going to use the word sex workers, mm-hmm. uh, officially licensed to serve the male populace, but also a corresponding group appointed to serve the inside of the palace. So you have sex workers who are employed to service the women inside of the palace, because as we all saw, there were no men inside the palace. So I thought that was interesting, but um, you know, it's definitely like the, the one bit of like, like, and they were romantically involved with each other was probably just some, like, fucking white dude being like, you know, the, the peculiarities of Sappho. Ooh. Yes. Uh, it is very interesting, yeah. though, that the quote from Richard Burton is, as a rule. Right. Almost almost just, I like, outing them. <laughs> if, if that is, in fact, true, it's right. like, so I have on good word, as a rule. Well, I mean, <laughs> They're I think all it's, lesbians. you know... <laughs> Yeah, it's it's definitely like, well, you know, generally, how much of this are you observing, dude? Right, like, exactly. <laughs> reporting from inside the palace. I don't yeah, I can so. guarantee <laughs> yes. you. I can guarantee you you're not there for most of what you probably Absolutely. You do not have a first-hand account, Mr. Burton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as we wrap up with the Dahomey Amazons, you know, we just wanted to mention, like, it's a complicated legacy. They were really interesting and transgressed a lot of roles as women, but it's not this, like, kind of feminist paradise ideal that we have. And also, the Dahomey Amazons, the, you know, were acting as the arm of a king who was doing a lot of expansion and aiding in the enslavement of fellow neighboring African tribes. There was a lot of participation in capturing members of these neighboring tribes, especially the Yoruba, and selling them to the Portuguese into the slave trade. So, you know, we just want, like, we couldn't get through, you know, talking about these folks without saying, like, we wanted to highlight them as, like, hey, 
on one hand, there's some really fucking awesome stuff here. And on the other hand, did you know that like everything in Africa was really fucking complicated Mm -hmm. in the 1800s? And, you know, because... Europeans and white people are coming in with this, a lot of indigenous folks, you know, in order to protect yourself, protect your wealth, etc, etc. A lot of people got involved within. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Yes, history is incredibly complex. (laughs) Yeah. In other news, we state once more. (laughs) Yes. I'm excited to announce that this episode is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. We're so grateful to be able to partner with sponsors like these guys who help keep the show going and enable us to bring you even better content, pay guests, and more. Surfshark VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network if you're an internet old like me, is an awesome app and browser extension that not only protects your privacy online, but changes your virtual location on your phone or computer to anywhere in the world, allowing you to access the internet as if you were actually in a different country. This, of course, allows you to bypass geo-restrictions and access websites and content that you might not usually be able to see. For example, let's say you just got done listening to our episode on bisexual Mexican artist, communist, and rumored lover of Josephine Baker, Frida Kahlo. And now, understandably, you'd like to stare at the beauty that is Selma Hayek for two hours while she and Alfred Molina portray Kahlo and her husband Diego Rivera in the masterpiece that is Julie Taymor's 2002 biopic Frida. But it isn't available over here on Netflix in the US. However, if you go over to Surfshark and switch your virtual location to Germany, voila. All the Selma Hayek kissing ladies you could ever want. Plus, Surfshark will make your everyday internet surfing way more secure by masking your IP address, keeping you safer from hackers. And it will also encrypt your online data as an added layer of security to keep all your passwords, personal information, and historical not safe for work images you may have saved to your computer for completely educational purposes nice and safe. Surfshark is offering an insanely good deal for History is Gay listeners. You can use our special promo code History is Gay, all one word, to get 83% off and three extra months for free. Plus, Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee so you can try it out completely risk-free. Head on over to surfshark.deals slash history is gay, or you can simply click on the link down in the show notes below for this episode. Check them out, support us, and get back to all the queer internet shenanigans of your dreams safely from anywhere. So our, our next folks, we're going to do a hop, skip and a jump uh, over the oceans into Japan. And we're going to talk about Ona Bugesha, who were the equivalent of female samurai in pre-modern Japan. So for most people in the Western world, when we think of like samurai warriors, an inherently male image pops up. We even did an entire episode on men loving men relationships among samurai in the Tokugawa or Edo period. Uh, but there existed a group of women warriors called Onabageisha who fought in battles and defended their homes and were the stuff of like legends and myth and dated all the way back to 200 AD, even predating the rise of this like male samurai class in the late Heian period. So Meg, why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit about the history and roles for women in pre-modern Japan? Yeah, so throughout the history of the country, Japanese women were subject to pretty rigid expectations of marriage, domesticity, and motherhood, (laughs) something we don't know anything about as Americans, (laughs) though these fluctuated from period to period. Yeah, uh, however, during the 5th and 6th centuries, Japan was actually led by several empresses. This time period is also referred to by some sources as the Epoch of Queens. Uh, There were eight empresses in total, and this is actually where we get our first inspiration for the Onabageisha in the legend of Empress Jingu, who we'll go into shortly. While women in Japan were always educated to be wives and mothers, albeit with significant education and knowledge in politics, martial arts, and diplomacy... Sounds like a dream, by the way. I'd love to study all that. (laughs) The status of women began to significantly shift with the onset of the Edo period in the 17th century and the influence of Neo-Confucian ideals. Social acceptance of women greatly diminished, and soon the idea of women warriors became less palatable than the prioritization of them as wife and childbearer in a society in which the status quo was now based on a new order of peace, political stability, and frigid social convention. Women warriors in this period were not permitted to travel alone without male presence, had to get specific permits to travel at all, 
and received frequent harassment from officials at checkpoints. The relationship between a husband and wife became more like that of a lord and his vassal, and women warriors at this time, once married, were expected to bring their weapons with them to their husband's home, but use them only for spiritual training rather than battle, and to help uphold and cultivate a domestic life that valued order and subservience to a husband. Yeah, so you really get this kind of shift, and that's where we start to see a little bit more of like this stereotype of Japanese women as really demure and really, uh, you know, focused on the home and and doing things like that. So who were the Onabugeisha? Onabugeisha translates literally to female martial arts practitioner or female warrior, and they fought alongside male samurai in times of need and war. They would usually be defending their villages and protecting their households and family. So most of the time they were more defensive fighters, and a lot of times were actually uh, wives of samurai. A smaller subset of Onabugeisha were women who actually took part in offensive battle, and these were known as Onamusha. Uh, these women were part of the Bushi class, so that's the, the class of feudal warriors, same as the male samurai, so kind of higher, higher class here. They were nobles, and thus they had the legal right to supervise lands as jito, or stewards. In terms of their weapons, we might have, like, the image of samurai warriors wielding katana, uh, seared in a, into our brain, but Onabugesha were trained in other weapons like the Naginata, a long kind of polearm sword, so it was on a big, big stick and it had like a curved blade. And they also used the Kaiken dagger and were well versed in the art of knife fighting called Tanto Jutsu. These weapons were like specifically designed for women and they gave advantages in distance fighting, basically allowing these women to be uh, fast and nimble while facing male opponents who might have been physically stronger. It's them. basically like the Bic pen for women, except a sword. You know, <laughs> like a long time ago. Like, they were all pink. I don't they know. They were if you knew all that. pink, <laughs> like very long. But and these pink. actually have like function <laughs> as like ah yes, most of these women were probably smaller than <laughs> than, yeah. than men, as opposed to Bic Bic for women, which is oh no, my dainty lady fingers my- cannot get around this pen. Teeny tiny dainty hands. <laughs> Do you remember? Was it? Was it Doritos for women? There was also Are, Doritos what? for women, I think. Good Christ. Yeah, it's insane. Wow. Uh, the Onobageisha fought on nearly every battlefront and served alongside the male samurai all throughout feudal Japan. And female warriors made up a large part of the samurai class for centuries. And they only really kind of began to subside with the Edo period or the Edo period and the influence of Neo-Confucianism that changed the status and function not only of, of these women, of the Onobageisha, but also of the male samurai, where they kind of moved from being warriors to more of a bureaucrat status and role. And so now we want to we want to mention a couple of significant Onabugeisha warriors in legend and history. And I say both of that because it's, you know, gets kind of muddy with a couple of them. Cool. OK, so Empress Jingu is first. Legend dating back to 200 CE from the Nihon Shoki, History of Japan and the Kojiki. Wife of Emperor Chiwa'i, who died in battle, birth name Okanaga Tarashi, until she took the title of Empress Jingu. Empress Jingu was enraged by the death of her husband and vowed to avenge him. In the story, she seeks out and kills the rebels who murdered him. Badass. And then subsequently leads an army into battle to conquer an area known as the Promised Land. At that time was known as Silla, which is modern day Korea. So she was like, don't kill my husband or I'll kill all of you and then also get together an army and try to conquer your land. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, I think she has a somewhat complicated legacy in Japan these days because of like the really complicated history of Japan's relationship with Korea. Mm -hmm. Um, But like that being said, she's still like a huge, uh, hugely emblematic figure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, A quote from Vice about her, Jingu is said to have been pregnant with the future emperor when she bound her body, donned men's clothes and rode into battle. Mulan, anyone? Maybe like a right? more more adult, like R-rated Mulan. <laughs> uh, she yeah. returned to Japan after three years and ascended the throne as emperor. Her reign thought to be about 201 to 269 CE. That's a long time. Ruling until yeah. her death, after which her son took the throne as emperor Ojin. 
She was considered to be the 15th Japanese emperor until her name was removed from the list during the Meiji Restoration, making her son the 15th ruler. <sighs> Erasure! It was like a general... Well, it was, it was like more of a... Uh, it, it was like an evaluation of, um, of, you know, the emperor line. So she's not the only one that got, you know, kind of rejiggered around. But, but yeah, it sucks that it's like, uh... A bunch of like kind of retro, like retconning of Japanese history to make it make sense with yep. what the narrative was post 1868. Understood. Empress Jingu, generally regarded by historians as a legendary figure, but her legends gave rise to and served as the first example of Onibu Geisha. And in 1881, Empress Jingu became the first woman to be featured on a Japanese banknote. Which is pretty cool. We still don't have a fucking woman on. Yeah, I was going to say 1881. Money, so. Okay. <laughs> Oof. Yeah, right? All right. Pretty good. Yeah, it, it erased from history of your emperors, but okay. <laughs> but, you On know. a piece of money. <laughs> yeah. Well, because she's such a, yeah, she's still like such a legendary figure, but they didn't, you know, keep her in the like line of emperors. Right. So next up, we have Tomoe Gozen, who lived from 1100 to 1247, if we're considering her an actual historical figure. Uh, so she's, you know, a mix of a legendary slash historical figure from the late Heian period, whose story was told in the epic The Tale of Heike, which was composed in the early 13th century, which was intended to commemorate particularly brave and devoted samurai. The Tale of Heike tells the story of the Genpei War from 1180 to 1185 in the late Heian period between two warring clans, the Taira and the Minamoto. And it's the conflict that actually led to the first shogunate, which is this group of like warring samurai lords that ruled Japan for a while. Tomoe Gozen was on the side of the Minamoto clan, assisting Minamoto Yoshinaka, who was the leader. She's one of the few women in the historical record who was an Onamusha, who was one of the women who went off to fight in battle, and even fought another Onamusha on the Taira side, Hangako Gozen. She was so revered by her reputation that the Heike notes that Yoshinaka considered her Japan first true general. Wow. Yeah, right? That's pretty great. Uh, she's described in the tale of Heike as, quote, especially beautiful, with white skin, long hair, and charming features. She was also a remarkably strong archer, and as a swordswoman, she was a warrior worth a thousand, ready to confront a demon or a god, mounted or on foot. She handled unbroken horses with superb skill. She rode unscathed down perilous descents. Whenever a battle was imminent, Yoshinaka sent her out as his first captain, equipped with strong armor, an oversized sword, and a mighty bow, and she performed more deeds of valor than any of his other warriors. Which is wow. high praise. What an amazing description. I right? envy this. <laughs> to live up to that yeah. is so cool. It's amazing. So she commanded over 300 samurai against 2,000 Taira clan warriors in 1184. And later that year, during the Battle of Awazu, which is like the big battle of this, uh, she killed many enemies and beheaded a fierce, well-known leader. She, quote, lay in wait for an enemy, and there appeared one famous for his strength throughout the province of Musashi, Onda no Hachiro Moshige, with 30 horsemen. Tomoe charged in among them, went straight to Ondo no Hochiro, fiercely seized him, and pinned his head on the pommel of her saddle, then wrenched it around, cut it off, and tossed it away. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? That description is, is a what? It's, it's so fucking metal. <laughs> That's insane. Just, <laughs> just twists off the head. I just That's love insane. tossed it and tossed it away. Just tossed Hell it away. Yes. Like, whatever. Uh, she influenced generations of samurai, and she's been celebrated in countless books, music, poems, and popular culture. And there's also several traditional Naginata schools, which were specifically created from her influence and even named after her. I'd love to see some of this stuff. I wonder if we can link to it. I want to oh, yeah. see. Uh, great. So I'm going to talk about Nakano Takeko. Uh, lived from 1847 to 1868. As mentioned above, the onset of the Edo period at the beginning of the 17th century saw the decline of the Ona Bogesha, with increased restriction and changing roles among the warrior class. But by the 17th century, they had a short-lived renaissance with the rise of the Tokugawa shogunate and a renewed interest in combat and focus on the warrior class. More Naginata schools were opened and women were defending their homesteads again as they had centuries earlier. 
By the late 19th century, during a time of unrest between the Takagawa clan and the imperial court, complete with a coup and the installation of a new 15-year-old emperor. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. A new group of female warriors was created called the Joshitai, which means girl's army, and was ruled over by a very young, meaning only 21-year-old, Unabageisha named Nakano Takeko. We have recreation of a photo of her from the 19th century in the show notes, and she looks so fucking cool. She really does. It's She's just like decked out in so much armor and she's got this like steely gaze and you're like, I'm scared and also really like want to hang out oh, with sorry. you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mark me down. I thought, scared and <laughs> that's, that's what you're saying. I was like, I'm going to help you out. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. I appreciate it. <laughs> so she had been trained to use the Naginata by this time, slightly shorter and lighter than the traditional weapon. So that was that long pole that you were talking about with the mm-hmm. curved blade on the end. Yeah, the, po- the like pole arm sword. Cool. Sort of mid-range weapon, short to mid-range weapon. And since her father was a high ranking official in the Imperial court, she had been trained in martial arts and received premier education. Takeko was recruited to lead the unofficial unit of 20 to 30 women during the Battle of Aezu in 1868 in the counterattack against 20,000 soldiers of the Imperial Japanese Army descending on Wakamatsu Castle. Her Joshitai joined about 3,000 Aizu clan samurai against the army in battle and killed at least five enemies with her blade before being shot in the chest and was dying. Right? I know. These 20 to 30, like, young girls are, like, bursting into this battle and just hacking away at people with swords. Uh, and the dudes have guns. This is just such a 19th century moment, too, right? Isn't it? Right? Where it's like you're, this is a clashing of just such a strange overlap of weaponry mm-hmm. and culture. Oh, my goodness. I cannot believe they went into this battle with swords against right? this. Yeah. Um, so according to the historical record, she asked her sister to behead her so she couldn't be dishonored and her body wouldn't be taken as a trophy by the enemy troops. It's very noble. Her head was buried by her sister under a pine tree in Aizu Bangamachi Temple, which is now modern day Fukushima province, where a monument was later built in her honor. Takeko is considered to be the last great Una Bagesha, the battle of Aizu seen as the last stand for women warriors and one of the last times women participated in combat in Japan before the modern era. Yeah, kind of like the last hurrah. And she's obviously, you know, because it was <laughs> not super long ago is, you know, she's definitely 100% historical. We have pictures of her. Yes. Um, and it's, you know, it's questioned whether or not Tomoe Gozen was was actually a historical person. We've got birth and death dates. And, you know, since it was in the 13th century-ish, it's all kind of based on the writings. Um, but there's some really, really cool like woodblock prints showing a lot of her, her escapades, which will be putting in the in the blog post. So archaeological evidence where we're going to go, you know, we didn't necessarily need to go into archaeological evidence with the Mino because they were in the 1800s, but we're going to go into archaeological evidence for Japan and also for our Viking shield maidens, just like we did with the Amazons. So while the story of Empress Jingu can be mostly considered legend and to some extent Tomoe Gozen, there's considerable evidence that there's enough to suggest that women like her did in fact play similar roles at the time. So, you know, we're talking about like early, early with Jingu. Uh, Historically, and not just in the realm of fiction, there were, you know, functional female warriors during that period. There's a historian, Stephen Turnbull, who is the author of a book, Samurai Women, 1184 to 1877, who writes, An archaeological investigation of the tombs of the 4th century female rulers have revealed the presence of armors and weapons, so it's possible that they led troops into battle just as the Jingu legend. So we have here, you know, there are tombs and and archaeological excavations that are showing women buried with weapons. We've seen this before. And so I I love this. I love that we are just, you know, continually seeing this theme here. Yes. And while there is not a huge number of accounts of women warriors in the historical record, many scholars believe that many more women participated in battles than there were written about, and the archaeological record shows as much. So when the 105 graves from the Battle of Senban Matsubaru in 1580 were excavated, DNA evidence showed that 35 of them were women. Wow. That's like a third. That's like a lot. Yeah. That's a that's third a- of the people who were that that were found to be perished in this battle. That's amazing. That's crazy. Restorative narrative. We're here. Yeah, right? <laughs> 
Um, because the Una Bagesha were usually fighting to defend their property and family, it is quite common to find bones of women and children at places where there were castle sieges. But some other archaeological excavations have shown presence of female skeletons in battle locations where there was no castle. And in these cases, Japanese archaeologist Suzuki Horatsu argues that, quote, these women came here to fight and to die and were most likely part of the army, and that 30%, as we just talked about, of archaeological remains on battle sites across Japan that were away from castles were actually women. This this feels exactly like Adrian Meyer's book of like, yes. hey, surprise, there's so many more than were thought of. And if you're not finding them in this particular instance, you know, what other explanations do you have? Exactly. Let's re-examine these remains. Yeah. Right. And if there were so many of them, how did they get erased and forgotten from the historical narrative of samurai? We have so many questions of how did women get erased wherever? (laughs) Rochelle Nowaki, author of Women Warriors of Early Japan, notes that the relatively little information about women warriors isn't due to there not being many of them, but because of rapid social change. Quote, the historical depictions of these females are uncommon because of the changes that grew out of the political and society turbulence starting in the Kamakura period, which was 1192 to 1333. The apparent paucity of references indicates that women constituted a distinct minority of warriors, but the opposite was more probable, as evidence recording their accomplishments were lost to warring practices of the time. So they were they were too busy fighting. Right. To exactly. write it down <laughs> yeah. accurately. And then we have, you know, colonialism, uh, our, that old, our thing. old nemesis. <laughs> fuck, 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 colonialism. Yeah, so colonialism played a significant role as well. Yeah, Westerners essentially rewrote the history of Japanese warrior culture from an outside perspective, pretty much overlooking the women and elevating the idealized version of the masculine, honor-seeking samurai warrior and the demure, subservient Japanese woman. Because that sounded Ooh. better to them. <laughs> they liked it Because better. we fucking suck. Yeah. yeah. Suck. Just, just yeah. no bones about it. We fucking suck. Historian Stephen Turnbull notes the exploits of female warriors as the greatest untold story in samurai history. That doesn't mean they don't still have an impact and legacy in Japan, however. Every year during the annual Aizu Autumn Festival, young girls take part in a procession which commemorates Nakano Takeko and the Joshitai. And several other bushi class women are celebrated in various elements of pop culture and folklore throughout Japan. And I can only imagine that this will be elevated even more the more people know about it because it's so right. cool. Well, and that specifically reminded me, like, just reading about the Autumn Festival, is that reminds me so much of what, Luce, what you were saying in the last episode yeah. about the way that Atlanta was revered and young girls would go through their wrestling and their, you know, Brace, the bear races. practices yep. and foot races. Yeah. Uh, I love it when history is so, like, just beautifully cyclical. Oh, yeah, And that, you know, we could be all over the entire world and we have more in common than we think. And the things that separate us are completely arbitrary and manufactured, Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, absolutely. Like, humans are going to be humans wherever you are. Yes, our day-to-day life looks pretty much the same across all time and space, which I think is my favorite thing about history as well. All right, our last uh, case study, if you will, we wanted to talk a little bit about another warrior society renowned in history, the Vikings. This is is our last folks that we're going to talk about before we move into our pop culture tie-in. Uh, so we have our Vikings pointy hats and in their boats and, and <laughs> all of these ideas about them. Uh, the Vikings had very rigid social ideas around masculinity and gender roles, but Norse and Scandinavian sagas and mythology are rife with strong female warrior figures like the Valkyries and also Viking shield maidens. And so we have, you know, this question we want to investigate is were they real at all or have historical basis like we saw with the Amazons of Greek storytellers? Were there real life Lagerthas out there? Uh, what is what is that 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 Oprah gif? What is the truth? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I've I'm pretty sure that I've made that exact joke on this podcast before. That's so real. Are you, do you, Lee, do you watch um, the Vikings TV show? I've seen a teeny tiny bit of it, but I have not gotten a chance to like go through and binge it. Okay. I absolutely have seen all of the Vikings TV show. 
I, you know, I, I tell me your love of Lagertha. Oh yes, I love her so much. There are a couple of characters in that show that I love so much. I also would like to start a petition to change the title of that show from Vikings to Hair Porn. Ooh, um, because excellent. that's mostly <laughs> that's like, so many braids. It's that is an entire aesthetic element of the show that kind of pulls its own weight. So hell yes, <laughs> it's really great. Anyway, so I'm gonna be talking about Viking society and status of women. So Scandinavian seafaring warriors, known for their distinctive long ships and reputation for pillaging and raiding like pirates, settled and traded all throughout Europe, primarily from present-day Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, but they traveled as far as the Arabian Peninsula and North America. The Viking Age usually refers to the time period between roughly 800 CE and the late 1050s CE, shortly before the Norman conquest of England in 1066. Very famous year, we've all heard of it. It's like, it's a touchstone. Yeah. And the Normans were descended from the kind of intermixed between Vikings and Saxon people. Yes. So the Vikings were originally pagans who followed Old Norse religion, but later uh, Christianity also became common. Obviously, with interactions with uh, raiding monasteries, etc., they would have come in contact with Christianity. So women in Viking society were generally expected to be subordinate to husbands and fathers with little political power, but some written sources seem to indicate that Viking women, at least not of the lowest socioeconomic class, again, which this which theme. were basically which was basically a slave class exactly yes which would be anyone that was overpowered in raids would just like across the board they had more freedom than other women in medieval European society, especially if they weren't married. Most were housewives and social standing linked to their husband, though marriage allowed a woman authority over the household domain, and they were able to inherit part of the property when their husbands died. Married women could also divorce and remarry. So that's something that is unique, I think, in this culture, correct? Yeah, we absolutely. don't really see that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's a, that's a pagan influence, of course. When unmarried women reached the age of 20, they reached legal majority and they had the right to choose where they would like to live because they were considered full citizens with legal rights and independence. However, they could be subject to arranged marriage still. Yeah. And these liberties, you know, are usually attributed to the pagan era of Viking society. Many of them disappeared gradually with the introduction of Christianity, like it goes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Christianity ruining the fun the for time. everybody. So yeah, in terms of like the myths and legends in the saga, let's talk a little bit about like Viking shield maidens and Valkyries as we see them in the literature. They were popular figures in the Norse sagas, and these sagas like showed women being formidable warriors on the battlefield, which was like a stark contrast to the prescribed roles of Viking women basically serving their husbands. So while they had, you know, relative independence compared to other places in Europe at the time, it was still, you know, you are you are the lord of your own domain and your domain is the household and you are here, you know, you need to serve your husband. So we have the Valkyries and the word Valkyrie is derived from the Old Norse Valkyra or, or Valkyrja, meaning chooser of the slain. They were maidens who served Odin, who is the king of the Norse gods, and they were sent by him to the battlefields to choose who lived lives and who dies, and they would escort the fallen warriors to the halls of Valhalla, which was basically the, you know, the underworld or rather overworld where these men would drink and be merry and have a respite from, you know, their lives as fierce warriors until Ragnarok came and they would fight for Odin in the end of the world. Best afterlife ever, obviously. Best, yeah, right? Like, oh, you're <laughs> saying I get to go hang out and be around a bunch of pretty women and drink beer? Yeah, and cool. eat food in Love a hall it. with all my warrior friends? Yeah. Please. It's great. Un until you're then drafted into the war to end all worlds. Um, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Worth it! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Valkyrie rode horses, wore helmets and shields, and in some written accounts, they even flew. We know this if we, you know, um, if we watched According Zena. to the Xena accounts. <laughs> according, according to the Xena scrolls. Accounts, according to Gabrielle's scrolls, <laughs> um, they rode horses that flew through the air. Mm-hmm. Depending on different sources, Valkyries were either like immortal figures or supernatural beings, uh, or they could have been human women with certain supernatural powers that were like bestowed upon them by Odin. Yes. Uh, ruins. The ruins. Yeah. Uh, stories of the Valkyries can be found in both the Prose Edda and the Poetic Edda, uh, which are uh, some of the most important primary sources for Norse mythology. 
And then we have the shield maidens who were female warriors referred to throughout Scandinavian folklore and mythology, including in the Eddic texts, as well as other sagas, like the 13th century Hervarar saga Ok Heindrix is my best attempt sure. at that. And the 12th century Gesta Danorum, which is a chronicle of Danish history by the writer Saxo Grammaticus. And shield maidens were women who took up arms and dressed in the armor of men and fought on the battlefield. And, you know, the historical existence of them has been debated. Obviously, most people are, you know, not saying that Valkyries existed because, you know, most women can't fly. Or take people to the, you know, the afterlife. Most, most. I'm we don't know. Most. I not, mean. Not all I, women. I, look, no, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and so we have this, uh, we have this excerpt from the Gesto Danorum in which Saxo Grammaticus writes about the shield maidens at length that I really wanted to put in here because it's just, it's a really good quote. There were once women among the Danes who dressed themselves to look like men and devoted almost every instant of their lives to the pursuit of war, that they might not suffer their valor to be unstrung or dulled by the infection of luxury. For they abhorred all dainty living and used to hearten their minds and bodies with toil and endurance. They put away all the softness and light-mindedness of women and inured their womanish spirit to masculine ruthlessness. They sought, moreover, so zealously to be skilled in warfare that they they might have been thought to have unsexed themselves. That was the part that I was like, I gotta include this in here. Mm -hmm. These women, therefore, just as if they had forgotten their natural state and preferred sternness to soft words, offered war rather than kisses and would rather taste blood than buses and went about the business of arms more than that of amours. How poetic. Right? Yeah. I, I was like, I have a really abbreviated quote of this, but <laughs> I really want to include all of the flowery language. I feel like that last bit is good. in my uh, IG profile descriptor. <laughs> Offered war Lines. rather than kisses yeah. and would rather, rather taste blood than buses. Arms more than amours. It's my <laughs> yes. new hashtag. Love it. Uh, so we, we picked out just two. There's many, many, many more, but we just really briefly wanted to pick out two shield maidens from the literature that we're going to talk a tiny bit about. The first is Hervor, not to be confused with herbivore, Hervor, <laughs> shield maiden from the Hervorar saga, who defies gender norms and roles from childhood. Born after the death of her father, she refuses to take on duties like sewing, instead prefers archery, sword fighting, and horse riding. So this is interesting. She was born basically fatherless, but she just- Like Atalanta. Like Atalanta. She thought. Yes. Yes, that's right. Dressed as a man and fought, pillaged, and killed under a male name of Hiorvard, very different from Herver, and went off in search of her father's magic sword, Tearfing. The sword is named Tearfing. Yeah. Badass. I mean, you know, it's a very, have, very common You have to name your sword. And, I mean, what are you, yeah. are you not what are you doing? your sword? What are you doing? You leave your sword <laughs> nameless? What are you going to have a magic sword without a name? What's wrong with you? <laughs> You're right. Nameless <laughs> magic sword. You might as well not even have it anymore. So Herver, <laughs> Herver, even later, learns to summon the dead. Now, this comes out of nowhere. You're sort of like, <laughs> she goes and searches. Well, it, it comes with it comes with the sword. I didn't, I like, I was like, oh, God, how much do we go into this? Like, we don't have time to go into all of these, like, <laughs> sagas. But yeah, like, there's a whole thing where she, like, goes to an island to find the sword, and she finds the sword, and then she can't get away from the island, and crazy stuff happens, and I can't remember exactly how she summons the dead, but it happens. Now, so. do you think that she tries? to summon the dead because she's summoning her father. I think that's what it is. Okay. I can't remember. This is... I think she tries to yeah, I think she tries to summon her father. This is real Hamlet I think to me. That's what it is. I don't know. Yeah, very. <laughs> well, I mean, Hamlet is the story of a king of Denmark. So it's all like Shakespeare got it all from these sagas mm -hmm. from these from these Herver. uh you know these <laughs> Nordic the fervor of Herver. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Oh, that you know what that would be? That would make a really fucking good all girl band oh, name. Oh, hell yeah! The fervor, and it's got to be like, uh, it's got to be really like symphonic Absolutely. metal. Absolutely, yeah. Right, like very Scandinavian. Very much. Shit. <laughs> Excellent. Loving you, this. you and me, Meg. Right? Okay. That's oh yeah. You guys project, can go right? to Eurovision next year. 
Perfect. Yeah, we know Eurovision as fervor as of her. That's right. We actually don't have any instruments. We just have magic swords that are named <laughs> and we clang them. It's a very rhythmic production. Tell us okay. about Rusha. I'm going to tell you about Rusla. R- Rusla. Okay. <laughs> tell me. Tell us about Russia. I have no idea. <laughs> tell us about Russia. Um, so Rusla is a figure from the Gesta Danorum, a shield maiden also known as the Red Woman in Irish lore, from her reputation for being bloodthirsty in battle and taking no prisoners. Uh, she Hi. led an uprising... Thank you. She led an uprising against the Danes, who tricked her brother out of his crown, forming an entire fleet of pirates to attack Danish ships in revenge. This also sounds like Grace O'Malley. Yeah, it's like Grace O'Malley and and also a little bit of like, at least with the, you know, the red woman reminds me of Anne Bonny. Yes. Of just like, like unhinged, you do not want to come across this woman. Female pirates. (laughs) Am I right? right? Yeah. <laughs> she was always always accompanied by another woman, sometimes noted as her sister. Oh, sisters. There you go. Uh, Stikla, who acted as her deputy. Stikla turned to piracy to avoid marriage, and we all know what that's about. Stikla! Did you just Stella? <laughs> St- I, st- you just I did? Stella'd Stikla. Oh, no. You Stella'd Stikla. Stikla'd. I love it. Rusla and, and Stikla. Is like a, there you it, go. It's like a new CW uh, sitcom. It sounds like a children's <laughs> oh, book to me. Oh, okay. Um, sure. Well, I don't know. Saxo Grammaticus writes of Rusla, quote, she whose prowess in warfare exceeded the spirit of a woman. Just like, it's like a backhanded compliment for the ages. That is well, sure. backhanded, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's sure. very connected. It really has a lot to do with the way that masculinity was viewed in Viking society at this time. Like, it was really, really completely ingrained in the society. So, you know, I think to us now, we're like, fuck, that's a backhanded compliment. Like, you, you can't be a woman who has prowess in warfare. And thus you must, et cetera, et cetera. But like, much like the way that the Mino were referred to, it's, we have this language at the time that's like, wow, amazing. Yeah. And, you know, in a 21st century context, we're like, well. Yeah, it's comparative. <laughs> All of it is right. in a in a box. But what can you do? So we have this question of like, okay, did they really exist? right? Most scholars consider shield maidens, like the supernatural Valkyries, to be purely characters of myth and legend. But we all saw how that line of thinking turned out when applied to the Amazons yep. of wrong. Greek antiquity. You're wrong. You're wrong, right? Like, so many historians are like, they must be purely beings of myth and created out of anxiety for blah, 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 blah. So, like, what actual historical and archaeological evidence do we have for female warriors in Viking society? One caveat to the existence of these women in the literature, especially in regard to, like, Saxo Grammaticus, is that many of these sources that they appear in uh, were written later in the record and so may have been inspired and influenced by Christian sources. And so, you know, obviously can't be, like, considered as one-to-one fact. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have historical basis. And one of the ways we see that is, much like we saw with the Amazons, there are, along with the literature appearances, several, like, figurines that have been excavated in archaeological sites that depict Valkyries and shield maidens and depict women with various weapons all over grave sites. So that iconography was there all over. So perhaps the biggest piece of evidence is the confirmation of the Viking grave at Burkas Sweden, which is one of the most famous Viking warrior burial sites, and it actually belongs to a woman. Grave site labeled BJ581, first excavated in 1889 by archaeologist and ethnographer Hjalmar Stolp. The remains were, of course, originally thought to be of a male warrior. The skeleton was buried together with weapons and clad in rich garments of silk and silver thread decoration. The weapons included were a sword, an axe, spear, armor-piercing arrows, two shields, and a knife. And this uh, individual was also buried with two horses. Really full, nice burial. Good gravesite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, lo and behold, a 2014 osteological analysis and DNA evidence in 2017 reveals that the skeleton was actually female, making this grave one of the best pieces of scientific and historical proof of women Viking warriors. Way to go, BJ! BJ 581! (laughs) (laughs) 
estimated to be <laughs> alternate title for your for your <laughs> memoir. BJ Way to go, BJ five eighty one. <laughs> Way to go, BJ. Oh boy. She was estimated to be between thirty to forty years old. Came from a rich family and was five foot seven. It really says something um, about how short I am. That I see like, oh, she was five foot seven. And my brain is like, hello, tall Viking lady, please be my wife. Because I'm <laughs> fucking short. I'm like, oh, a woman that's five seven. Dear heavens. To be fair to you, maybe you were born in the wrong era. Because I think people were generally shorter back then. <laughs> True. They were. <laughs> The artifacts and her bones suggest that she could have traveled from as far as Dublin, Ireland, to at least Kiev, Russia, in her years of her life. So she got around. Sorry, can around. we explain that? How do we know that? Probably the stuff that she ate. Yeah, it was actually her- The composition of an her- Analysis of, of, of the stuff left in her teeth. Yep. Oh, wow. Okay. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Because like, yeah. I mean, and also from the last episode that we did, female Scythians had millet in their bones. That's how- Yeah. Mm-hmm. So right. it's, yeah, similar to that. Archaeology is fucking it's cool. It's nuts. Yeah. She was also most likely high ranking in addition to being rich and 5'7". Considering she was buried with pieces from a board game, Charlotte Heden Stierna Johnson- who led the 2017 study, explains, quote, The gaming set indicates that she was an officer, someone who worked with tactics and strategy and could lead troops in battle. Yeah, yeah, so using it as like a a way to go through strategy. Right. Like it shows that she had that kind of strategic It was like risk. Yeah. Catan or something. Basically, she was a total fucking catch, is what we're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I say, tall Viking lady, please be my wife. Not everyone is convinced, though, and the concept of Viking female warriors existed outside of fantasy is still somewhat controversial. Professor of Viking Studies at the University of Nottingham, wait a second, there's a professor of Viking Studies, whoa, and her name is Judith Jesh, tends to be skeptical about the gravesite and cautions other scholars not to get carried away, saying that since it was excavated originally over a century ago, it could have been tampered with. And that there could have been genetic contamination of BJ581, which would um, be terrible. Oh, sounds right. Like a, that sounds like a stretch to me. Sure. I don't know what genetic yeah. contamination I, even means, honestly. That like the people who excavated it in 1889 could have gotten their DNA their bone, on it. Their bones on, on her their bones. bones, on her <laughs> right, bones. Yeah. Their bones on her bones. Also, also, <laughs> also there was an osteological analysis. You're trying like, to say yeah. they rubbed their bones together? Oh God! <laughs> uh, yeah, well, like this is this is what frustrates me is that like Jesh and the other skeptics like go on to argue that even if even if the DNA is accurate, maybe the weapons surrounding the body had no bearing on her role, and they could just be symbolic or ritual. And I'm just sitting here going like. <sighs> But of course, we don't question the presence of these weapons and tools in like a male warrior's grave. Right. So why suddenly do we do this shit with a woman? The, like because it doesn't fit your conception of what a woman's supposed to be doing. Right. Oh, and the two horses were just her pets, and the the sword was actually used for cooking. And, and well, you know what we also don't do? We never assume that two like same sex couples in burials are right. have any kind of romantic relationship. Like anything that would normally be assumed if it was. A heteronormative Absolutely. seeming situation is immediately thrown out the window and they're friends or brothers or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like messed up. So Charlotte uh, Hidden Stierna Johnson will back us up on this. She has a quote. So she's the leader of the 2017 DNA study on the Burka grave. She says, since the site was excavated in the 1870s, it has constantly been interpreted as a warrior grave because it looks like a warrior grave, and it's placed by the garrison and by the hill fort. Nobody's ever contested it until the skeleton proved to be female, and then it was not a valid interpretation anymore. So Damn. Like, I'm sorry, so Judith much. Jesh, professor of Viking studies, but I don't like you. Sorry mm-hmm. if you listen to this podcast, but please open your mind. Hey, Judith! Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, What's so, up? Like, we have at least... <laughs> 
<laughs> so we have at least this one grave site, right? And there are actually multiple other graves containing weapons and military goods around the Baltic Sea that have been discovered to be female. But, you know, the Burka one is just, that's the one that has the best and most definitive proof of the person in the gravesite being a warrior and, like, seeing combat. And so, you know, if we know anything from what we talked about with the Scythians and what's been discovered in Japan, it goes to say that... I mean, this is very recent, right? Like, this is a 2017 analysis. There's gonna be more discovered. And more definitive proof is just out there waiting for us. You can't have just one. That's You don't have an outlier like that, as we've seen. Yeah, that's right. And also, as soon as critical eyes are opened and we start looking and reinterpreting information and evidence in different new ways, then yeah, it's definitely gonna lead to more. So let's talk about Valkyries and Shield Maidens as third gender, possibly gender transgressing folks. So there are some controversies going on right now in Viking studies about the understood frigidity of gender roles. Nancy Marie Brown, who is the author of The Real Valkyrie, The Hidden History of Viking Warrior Women, notes, quote, If you look at this one group of sagas called the sagas of ancient times that are often overlooked because they have all these fabulous creatures in them, like dragons and warrior women, it's really interesting because these girls grow up wanting to be warriors. They're constantly disobeying and trying to run off and join Viking bands. Uh, Me too. But when they do run off and join the Viking band, or in another case, become the king of a town, they insist on being called by a male name and use male pronouns. Yeah, that was a a fun one. Yeah. We also have, uh, there's an article that I found that honestly, like, please go ahead and if you can find it, if you have access to JSTOR, please read the entire thing. We only had the ability to put a tiny little bit in here. It's by a scholar named Kathleen M. Self. It's it's an article in an issue of a journal called Feminist Formations and she argues that Valkyries and Shield Maidens can actually be seen as belonging to like a third gender. Yes, blurring the boundaries between masculine and feminine. Based on the way these women warriors adopt behaviors, dress, and roles that were so specifically coded as masculine in Viking society. Quote, the Valkyries and Shield Maidens' presence on the battlefield itself is also masculinizing. The battleground is the preeminently masculine domain where true masculinity is displayed, tested, made, or lost. A truly manly man seeks combat from an early age and rejects the feminine spaces of the home. Self examines the way that these two female archetypical figures move between a third gender and a female gender based on their presence in battle, their dress, and their own transitions into marriage, in the case of shield maidens from many of the stories. Yeah, Uh, so, you know, there's a whole lot more to it and self goes into specific stories from these sagas. There's some really interesting arguments about the ways in which Valkyries and Shield Maidens kind of possess this like middle space. And that a lot of times in the sagas, as soon as Shield Maidens are revealed to be, you know, they, they're, they've they removed their armor, they've gotten married, they kind of lose their agency, which is the thing that moves them into being like a feminized marker, which is really fascinating. So I, I implore you to read the whole article you know we also know that there's some really fun gender fucky stuff just based on like norse mythology and loki so you know it's not a surprise to see this kind of argued here uh so yeah so let's move into uh you know we've talked a little bit about where you can see a whole bunch of cool stuff about these people but there's a whole bunch of really neat pop culture tie-ins that we wanted to bring up so you can go out onto the internet and discover all of these folks in multiple fictionalized ways For the Mino or Dahomey Amazons, what I thought was the fucking coolest is that they are the inspiration for the Dora Milaje in Black Panther. Yes. Which is really cool. They took a lot of inspiration from that. And also there's a lot of history of Dahomey and the way that the king is envisioned that has to do with panther imagery, which is really neat. And so you have 2019, Lupita Nyong'o visited Benin for the documentary Warrior Women, which was done by BBC. And in it, she interviews the woman who was part of the Agoje. And actually, if you check out the sponsor for this episode, you can trick your computer into thinking that it's in the UK and you can actually watch the documentary like I did because my computer was like, oh no, you can't watch this on the BBC Channel 4 because you're in the United States. And then I went over to Surfshark and I pressed the little button that said, hey, make it seem like I'm in the UK. And then I got to watch it. So if you're wondering how to do that, you should go back to the details in the ad that came earlier in this episode. That's 
hot shit. Uh, They also show up in Lovecraft Country. The character of Hippolyta is transported to Africa where she becomes a Dahomey Amazon and is trained by Nawi, who is based on the last known living Agoje who died in the 1970s. Amazing. For the Onabigasha, the Smithsonian Channel did a historical documentary called Samurai Warrior Queens. Tom Ogozin is the subject of a novel trilogy by Jessica Amanda Salmonson from the 1980s. First book is called The Disfavored Hero. And Tom Ogozin shows up as a supporting character in the 2010 sci-fi series Riverworld. And several video games have Tom Ogozin as a character or characters based on her, including Persona 4, Rise of Kingdoms, Infinity Kingdom, and Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. And as far as Viking warrior women, we talked about this, but the 2013 History Channel drama series called Vikings, Lagatha, played by Catherine Winnick, is she's portraying the character that is the greatest shield maiden in the world. And she is totally awesome throughout the entire series. So highly recommend. Erwin from Lord of the Rings, aka I Am No Man, is referred to as a shield maiden as well in the novels. And Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So the game's historical advisor, Thierry Noel, said, quote, the archaeological sources are highly debated on that specific issue, but it was part of the Norse conception of the world. Sagas and myths from North society are full of tough female characters and warriors. It was part of their idea of the world that women and men are equally formidable in battle. All right. Well, we have reached the end of our time together. So we're gonna give our how gay were they ratings. So last time we we hazed y'all by having Megan go first. And then uh, <laughs> yeah, we all paid the price on there. What on happened was the great hot dog debate um, <laughs> of 2021. So this time I'm gonna give that honor to Luce and haze you by asking you to go first. If you can rate the Mino, the Onabogesha, and Viking Shield Maidens on our totally arbitrary scale in queerness, what would you do? Okay. Here's what I've got. I think I give the Dahomey a 17 Naginata rating. Ooh, we're mixing our metaphors. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think definitely the female husbandry. Yeah, I think that their rise to power in specifically queer, like forming of new queer status almost Mm. within the construct of their society, I would give them that many number of nice <laughs> that many number and that <laughs> many that number means. that many number nice. could i please yeah. have that many oh. number of hot dogs <laughs> thank you of hot dogs oh god here we are again <laughs> uh, <laughs> what about the onobagesha i'm gonna say oh now relative to 17 let's see i would say like nine nine mm. i think that's fair about just because still within traditional construct of a normative society, but transgressing gender roles, even though they're pretty rigid where they are. Right. And yeah. the queerness not so not so intense. And what about our Viking warrior ladies? Ooh. Same thing. I almost would say like like a seven? No, I'm going to go up. I'm going to go up to 11. I really like okay. odd numbers, apparently. I'm going to go to 11. I'm a little bit influenced by the Viking show, which has some definite queer storylines in there. So Excellent. That is that is definitely tipping my, my scale. But uh, yeah, same thing within the construct of the society. Still binary gender roles that didn't necessarily allow for a lot of queerness, but there was a lot of transgression with gender and Valkyrie's like mythological influence of women coming in to women's experience as Vikings. So that's my assessment. Nice. All right, Meg, what about you? Okay, so I agree with Luce on everything and ditto, ditto, ditto for all three. That's and it. I'm gonna Good job. I'm gonna give <laughs> I'm gonna give my own special separate rating to Rusla and Stilka. Uh-huh. Ooh, excellent. Of the Vikings. They get a 20 out of 20 magic swords. Ooh. Wow. So delightfully phallic. Thank you. Excellent. BJ 581. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. 
I, I, yeah, I really like uh, your reasoning for these. That's kind of where where I fall on some of these. So I'd say, yeah, for the Dahomey Amazons, the Mino, I'll give them, let's see, a 14 out of 10 machetes. Okay. They were wielding machetes all the time. Big scary knives. And one of the reasons why they are so high is that idea of like, they fully encapsulated like a, a change in gender and a change in, in societal role along with that gender. Uh, for the Onobugesha, I would probably give like a, I'd, I'll say a five out of 10 bloody saddle pommels. Uh, mm. If we're going with the, you know, wrenching off of somebody's head, much yeah. for the same reasons that you were talking about, Luce, is I think they kind of fall under a little bit more of a traditional, like, heterosexual marriage. You know, a lot of them were wives of samurais, but I still think it's really cool that, you know, they are taking on this role of being the prime defender mm. of the homestead, which was something that was really considered most of the time, you know, masculine in raids on towns and on villages throughout history, it's traditionally been get the women and children out of here and the men will defend. And so to have that be a specific role that was given to women, that men would go off and fight these offensive battles and women were women were responsible for being the front line of defending everything that those men had to come home to, uh, I thought was a really interesting kind of flip yeah, on that. Yeah, it's a nice equality there. yeah. And for uh, our Viking shield maidens, I will give a, let's see, I gave a five and I gave a 14. So I'll give, I'll give like a, like an, I'll give a 10 out of 10 uh, flying horses Ooh. from Xena. Uh, flying Valkyrie <laughs> horses from Xena because I'm just really interested in that kind of in-between space and the arguing of third gender, um, especially in such a, a really rigid society of masculinity, or at least what the stereotypes have come to be. I know that a lot of people are doing work right now to kind of undo the thoughts about the ways in which masculinity is heralded as like one of the highest qualities in mm -hmm. these Viking societies. So I'm really interested to see kind of where scholarship is going to go from there. Yeah. Well, that is it for today's episode. You can find our illustrious co-hosts online individually. Thank you so much, the two of you, for coming on for not one, but two episodes. Thank you. And Thanks for having sharing, us. sharing with the world your love for restorative narrative and women warriors. And I have a feeling that we might see some of the people that we talked about today in some of your future work if <laughs> your pattern is anything to be uh, looked at. Yes, we have a record. <laughs> We're becoming predictable. So perhaps... <laughs> excitingly predictable yeah. honestly um can you let the listeners at home know where they can find more about you and your work on the world wide web yeah we have yeah. a website for all of our projects not just Cena warrior musical but for everything that we do it is lucierose.com l-u-c-i-e-r-r-o-s-e.com Beautiful. And I am Lee, and when I'm not nerding out about old-timey queer folks, I'm usually talking about comics and queer TV over at A Paradox in Flux on Twitter and crying about Xena episodes on my couch or with my friends on my podcast. History is Gay podcast can be found on Tumblr at History is Gay podcast, Twitter, and Instagram now, although I don't know how much I'll use it because I suck at that platform, but we are at History is Gay pod on both of those, and you can always drop us a line with questions, suggestions, or just to say hi at History is Gay podcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoy the show and want to support us in continuing to make it, you can support us on our newly revamped Patreon. Woo! Mm -hmm. As a patron, you can get access to our new super secret Discord server. We also have our Sappho Salon minisodes, where we'll treat you to love letters and poems from queer historical faves. We have our pop culture tie-in live watches that will happen, and future queer history trivia nights, exclusive merch, and more. You can become a patron by going to the support section on our website or patreon.com slash historyisgay and join the ranks of our Patreon community along with the amazing whole bunch of folks this time around. So I'm going to enlist Luce and Meg to help me out with all of your wonderful names. So you can join along with the amazing Coco, Carla Eschenbrenner, Marin Schroeder, Rosie Solomon, Andrew McCullough, Randall Nelson Peterman, Jordan Liddell, Robert, Cecilia Allen, Louis Cole, and Lee Bregenman. Thank you all so much for your support. Couldn't do this without you. Y'all are amazing, and I am forever so grateful for everything that you do to make this podcast happen. 
You can also buy all some merch on our store. We've got some friends who are going to be working on some cool new merch for us. So keep an eye on that space. You can click on shop at our website. And lastly, remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It helps more people find the show and we can expand our awesome community. That's it for History is Gay. Until next time. Stay queer! And stay curious. Thank you.